if they get to the point of, man, this is an A-plus candidate, we're way into her, then we will not skip the step of calling references. And I promise you we have skipped that step in years past. And it comes back to bite you every time. Because as my partner pointed out, she's like, when you have a red flag, that's who you ask. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Seven Figure Music School. I'm here with Nate. And today we're tackling another big topic that he and I have encountered in working with Seven Figure Music School owners. So, hey, it's good to talk to you again, Nate. Daniel, this question is such a good one. Such a good one. It's a juicy one we're tackling today. What are we covering? Well, in the uh, in a recent episode that we recorded, which may or may not have come out, may, maybe it's in the past, maybe it's going to come after this one, um, we talk about making teachers feel, feel valued. And in the process of having that conversation, you and I, we saw, man, there's a lot more to mine here around, you know, potentially... How do you hire A plus teachers? Um, what are common mistakes that are made in hiring? How do you, you know, hire slowly, fire fast? We even used that terminology. So I think there's no shortage of things that we could talk about. And the real danger is trying to do all of it at once. So we decided just to slow things down and cover topics in a really in-depth way, in a helpful way where we can be more concrete, maybe be a little less abstract um, and actually bring a lot of value in diving into each of those, even those four topics I just mentioned in greater detail, as opposed to doing a high flyover and and saying things that more or less everybody knows. So you ask the question, what are we talking about? Well, let's jump into it. Um, There are five or six common mistakes Mm -hmm. that small business owners make when it comes to hiring. And Nate and I were talking before we hit record and even reminiscing about ways that we have made these mistakes in the past. Um, I did all of them, Daniel. Yeah. So I'm and, uh, <laughs> and so I thought, man, what a, what a great conversation to have around um, really the future of each music school. The success of each music school is really going to be in the product that's delivered. And the product that gets delivered is delivered by teachers and support staff. And so if the process to bring a plus teachers or a plus support staff into the business is weak if that process is weak if there isn't even a process there that's actually one of the common mistakes then you're leaving up to chance whether or not your school is going to function well or deliver a quality product or deliver it consistently so should i just jump into the first mistake there nate I would absolutely, and I think that um, you know we need to be reminded, um, you know, the definition of insanity. It's just making the same mistake over and over, and having no idea that we're doing it. You know, so this is a great topic because I bet you it's going to resonate with a lot of listeners. A lot of listeners are going to say, "Wait, I've made that mistake like four times already. It's time mm-hmm. for me to stop." Um, So, yeah, let's jump in. What is mistake number one on our list? Uh, It is, and this isn't in any particular order. These are just mistakes. These aren't ordered in any way, but hiring out of desperation. Mm -hmm. And to define that, I would say, you know, Friday, you have a teacher tell you uh, this. I'm giving my two weeks notice. Yeah. Or you have a support staff member give their two weeks notice or one month notice. And all of a sudden it's a r- race to beat the clock because I've got to get all these students situated with. Th- and so we're in kind of firefighting mode. Yeah. And, you know, I think there are platitudes, but beneath those platitudes, there really is some concrete good advice. And in s- to some degree, a lot of these are interconnected. So we might keep hitting upon the same topic, but just at a very basic level, um, solving the hiring out of desperation problem really is about anticipating what you need before you need it, whether it's support staff or teachers. So let me just put you on the spot, Nate, and say, yeah. how do you do this? How do you um, prevent yourself from having a situation like this? Or can you tell me, well, let's just start there. How do you prevent that from happening? How do, how do you hire with purpose? Yes, hiring with purpose. So 
And to restate the issue here, because you put it so perfectly, everybody in your company will eventually leave. That's just the reality of how it works. Even your, even your closest friends within the company, eventually, you know, life changes happen and they need to move on. And in fact, you want them to move on. But the question is, how do you anticipate when someone's going to move on? And then more importantly, let's say you do not anticipate it. How do you avoid that trap of just hiring like the first person who walks through the door because you're desperate to cover those 22 students? Okay, so anticipation in my experience, Daniel, comes down to a few things. Number one, it's being very clear about sort of your inventory and how many students every teacher has and within every department and being aware of those high value families and which teachers are sort of addressing them and just being like, okay, I've got a very clear picture um, because not every teacher within your studio is necessarily going to be operating at the same level. So you're going to have your A plus teachers, which I know we're going to get into on a future episode, but you're going to have your A plus teachers that are going to have a high retention rate, that are going to be dealing with high value families that are really important to your company. And those ones, those teachers, you need to be very aware of that collection of families that they serve. Uh, and in addition, you need to know that so you're going to have one or two B players. You might even have a C player. And you want to be aware of who those are. And I once went through this exercise uh, with my partner. We've done it actually a number of times. And it's actually quite, it feels weird, but it's a really important exercise. And it was given to us. It said, okay, I want you to list all of your staff. I want you to list your A players, B players, and C players. And we're like, you can't do that. They're, they're people. I mean, I love them all, right? But the reality is they're saying, look, you need to be able to assess each level of teacher and staff right now because you're going to need to have a different level of intention around hiring and replacing with your A teachers than you may be with your B and your C. And the truth is part of anticipation, Daniel, is making that list as painful as it is. And I have made that list like four or five times over the 12 years, you know, at BMF. And it, and it kind of sucks to make the list in a way because it's really a man in the mirror moment where you're like, whoa, these are the choices I've made and here's, mm -hmm. the, here's the organization I have. But once you make that list and you look and you say, huh, you know, I think I have a C plus teacher or two, you can begin to anticipate to proactively replace them before they give two weeks notice. And you're like, ah, next thing you know, you've got another C teacher. So that's number one around anticipation. You need to know your crew and you need to have a very clear way of assessing them. We can get into that in future episodes, but that's number one. Everybody can make an ABC list right now. You can pause the podcast right now and be like, I'm gonna make my list right now. Because I promise you, you can make that list. Even if it feels kind of uh, dirty at first, you're like, what? Yeah. So secondly is um, we have a uh, sort of, we have a we have a long list of subs, right? Every program, everybody gets sick, everybody needs substitute teachers, etc. We have a long list of subs, a lot of whom are pr past teachers from Brooklyn Music Factory. Different friends, teachers that were there here for years and have moved on, they stay on the list. Um, I'm a sub. Uh, there are other people, other directors in our program that are subs. When a teacher gives notice and says she's going to leave, um, the first thing I do and we do as a group is we actually get together um, and we make a, a little spreadsheet. We, we put all of their students down, their schedule down, the ages, the levels of the students, et cetera. And we try to internally cover that uh, teacher's roster um, for at least two more weeks after she leaves so that we can have a solid four week hiring process to find an A plus replacement. So right out of the gate, someone gives notice, you're like, ah, but the very first thing we do is we spreadsheet out a plan and we come up with a, you know, a four to six to eight week plan to cover those students. Uh, and so, you know, that's, it, it might sound like, well, Nate, I still got to go find people to cover. Well, guess what? Sometimes I go in there, I jump in the ring, I'm a cover because it's much cheaper, <laughs> as you know, Daniel, for me to cover for uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine lessons than it is to hire a B minus teacher and yes. have to replace them three weeks later. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay. so I'll stop there. Those are just a couple of ideas. So Nate, what it sounds like you're saying 
is that solving the hiring out of desperation problem actually has potentially less to do with the hiring process and more to do with the succession plan for each individual teacher. Understanding your org chart, understanding that uh, adjustments can be made, students could be covered, things of that nature. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, I um, have done in, in some of the teams and companies I've run is even cross-train people where I'll have maybe a junior level employee or more of an assistant level get promoted up because we've traded, uh, trained them in so many of the jobs of the person above them that if that person were to leave, that person kind of naturally slip into that role. And, and I can think of two times in the past year where I had someone make a major jump in responsibility um, and went from quarter time or part time even to full time because they absorbed the jobs of someone who was leaving and they did it so well because of the succession plan in place, the processes that were built inside the company, that sort of thing. And I don't think this is something only for Fortune 500. I think this is something that is no. really important for small business as well. Yeah, that's a, yeah. It's a really strong point. And to summarize what you said before too, it's a combination of a succession plan and the anticipation we were talking about, right? Mm. The anticipation is saying, I'm anticipating that this person is likely leaving, whether they leave on their own accord or whether they're actually not a good fit for the, for the school, the company. And as you're talking about, which is so smart to add into this, is that we're already thinking about who we have internally that might be able to level up their teaching schedule, that might be able to add a couple days, or in the case you're talking about, we just did that with our marketing director. We brought some people from internal who came in and cross-trained into covering some marketing roles, hmm. uh, which allowed me to much more slowly hire who I needed in a very focused way around marketing and generating more you know, leads for, the, for Brooklyn Music Factory. Yeah, stellar point, okay. So that kind of leads to the next one. Um, what do we got? That, that, the next common mistake is hiring without a clear job description. And I'll just describe this as saying that I've seen this over and over again, and I was guilty of this myself, uh, that mm -hmm. as business owners, as music school owners, we are often in a position of finding ourselves making things up as we go along. We mm -hmm. cannot do this. Um, and then I'm going to ping this over to you in just a second, but I'll start by just giving some really concrete things that I've learned over the years. All right, what do you got? Well, that is the need to document out exactly what the role is, the responsibilities of that role, and the systems that, that the, the future employer, the teacher will be, will be doing as a part of their job. Now, for a Why? teacher, there's a little bit less of emphasis on system. That is more of a support staff type person. Um, but especially for the support staff people, having a collection of systems that have either already been created or are being created for the role so that that person can come in on day one and know what they're, be what they're responsible for um, goes a long way for clarity on the part of the business owner to even know who they should be hiring. And it gives a better shot of the person that you are interviewing or potentially hiring to actually look at it and say, oh, I can do that or no, I cannot. Versus winging it, showing up to the interview or the day of the interview or the night for the interview kind of saying, okay, well, here's generally what I'm gonna say to the person and then going in vomiting out a bunch of improv improvised job roles and and what you'll be responsible for and then kind of hoping that it works out right yeah um mm. and what i ping it over to you nate and ask you this question um what do you see as crucial for hiring a teacher in other words when you guys hire a teacher at bmf do you have a formal job description that's put out what's your version of what's your version of what i just described yeah, I love that. Ponder this, Daniel, because I'm gonna come back to you for a concrete example of a of a responsibility that falls under a specific role. So you consider that for a second, but I'm gonna tackle your teacher question because I think sometimes job descriptions, uh, they can feel really abstract to a small business owner. They're like, I don't know, like it was me, my spouse, and two of my friends that are, are, are this company. I mean, what do you mean job description? 
like she does mostly everything and I handle sales, you know, right? So we need to get really concrete so people understand this. But let me go to teachers because um, what do we do at Brooklyn Music Factory? The hardest lesson for us to learn over the first dozen years of growing our program was that you are not hiring, say, a piano teacher. You are hiring an educator that is specialized with very specific age ranges and therefore levels, right? Sure, there might be a teacher that can cover age five to 55, but that's highly, highly unusual. And honestly, between you and I, you can't afford those teachers anyways, right? You're looking for a very specialized age range. You're looking for someone who's very comfortable with say age, and at BMF, we look at it this way, age four, or sorry, age four and five, that's one category we'd hire to, age six to eight would be another category, nine to 12 and 13 and up. And sometimes you have overlap, you'll have people that can handle six to 12. But it's very common for people to be really comfortable with a specific age range within a department. Okay, so that's just a very concrete thing that we would put on the job description. For example, when we hire for our summer camp, uh, we hire very differently than when we hire for the school year within, say, the guitar department. The summer camp, it's we're hiring people that have vast experience working in a classroom with anywhere from, you know, six to 36 students at once. That's who we're hiring. We're not hiring someone who's, we're not hiring a musician who loves to teach. We're saying, show us your classroom experience. That's a very specific um, sort of role that we're hiring to. Now, does that person also happen to be qualified to teach a one-on-one -on -one private lesson? Sure, but likely since our, uh, since our summer camp skews young, our summer camp is generally ages four to about, we top out around 10. Those teachers that thrive in summer camp are gonna really thrive in our beginner program. Hmm. Ones, right? Um, not always, of course, it's not cut and dry, but that's just a very concrete example. The second thing I would say is in our job description, this is the very first thing you're doing is establishing your mission, purpose and values right out of the gate. And I know you and I talk a ton about this because culture is way more important than small business owners uh, give it. They don't give it enough intention. They just sort of like, well, cult culture is a corporate thing. No, it's really, really valuable to put it in place as soon as possible in our small businesses. So in our job description on our landing page, if you want to apply, the very first thing you see is our mission statement. The very second thing you see is our seven core values, mm. right? For right out of the gate, a whole bunch of people looking at that are going to be like, what? Be the best version of yourself? Check your ego at the door? No, no, no. I, this isn't the job for me. Right. So right out of the gate, you're saying like I, we are setting an intention about the type of teacher that thrives in our community. Yeah. So just that's a little add on in terms of process. I know we're going to go deep into process in another episode, but I just need to share that. Yes. And again, this a corollary to the, the common mistake hiring without a clear job description would be that when there's a lack of clarity, you get what you get. Yes. And any kind of clarity you can bring to it. You might not be the best at writing job descriptions. No one is when they start, but any sort of intentionality that you put onto it other than, um, you know, the common, which is <laughs> kind of the nebulous wish Yes. You know, I can't tell you the number of studio owners I've spoken to where they said, oh, I, I, I want my goal is to only have students that practice a lot. Yeah, well, that's a wish. Right. My goal is to only have teachers that always show up on time and don't complain about the pay. That's a nebulous wish. Yes. That doesn't those things are possible. Uh, those are pop, but it doesn't happen by accident. Doesn't matter. Can I add one other thing, Daniel? Oh, please. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but no, no, no. This is a mistake we made in our job description. We used to not put the pay. Hmm. Why do I, why do we not put pay? Well, because we're afraid of scaring people off. Like we don't pay enough. Right. Or we think that pay is the reason why people will accept the gig. So you right. better put a big number, right? So that's a perfect example of what you're saying around lack of clarity. This is what we pay 
are hourly teachers. This is what a salaried position pays. If you're a salaried position, this is the amount of paid time off you start with. This is the retirement savings option, right? You just put it right there. Put it on the job description. Because just like you're going to get hyper clear about their role, the responsibility, um, all the things that they, they need to be held accountable to to thrive in the position, you also just want to say like, and this is how we operate. This is our operating budget. This is what we can afford. This is what we do. You yeah. know? And we never did that for years, dude. And then finally, I, someone was just like, what, what are you doing? You're getting a whole bunch of budget applicants that are just like tire kicking. Right. Yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. That's just a little, Oh no. So valuable for us. Uh, Maybe the last hack that I'll give personally that, um, before we move on to the third common mistake would just be, especially for support staff. Um, I think it is real. Something that was really helpful for me was to start collecting jobs that Mm. either needed to be done or done by someone else than me. Yes. Again, I'm talking the support stuff. So admin, billing, marketing, communication with family, sales, like all these sorts of things. Okay. So not necessarily with the teachers, but with support staff, because you're not going to run a seven figure music school without support staff, right? No. Start collecting those jobs and, and, and putting them on a job description sheet. And then if you want that little bit of extra polish, you can go out and there are lots of websites out there where you can look at other companies, other small businesses and their job descriptions. Yeah. And you can start finding comparables. You can find, oh, other companies have these same needs. This is how they wrote their job description. They're not saying to wholesale plagiarize it because that actually wouldn't be good for your company. Right. But you can at least get a sense of, oh, this is how it's formatted. Even something as simple as that. This is how it's formatted. This is... Um, how they describe this particular role. Oh, they're having someone do that. I didn't even know that someone could do that. I didn't know we could trust a person with that. You'll learn so much if you use my best friend, google.com and go out there and find comparable roles. And um, to quote one of my best friends and his, what he called his three-step foolproof songwriting process. One, one, listen to everything you possibly can. Two, shamelessly copy it and three and he always said this and daniel this is the most important step forget where you heard it (laughs) well (laughs) the same thing of course he's kidding but the same thing can be true when it comes to something like this as well you um there's a lot of wisdom that's out there and if you can use google to find it you can really put yourself ahead and learn quite a bit about how other companies operate and how they think even going to colleagues in the industry um, and if they're willing to share which of course is a fairly general piece of advice, but there's always that one person like, oh, I never thought of doing that. So if I can be helpful in that way, happy to do it. Should we move on to the third one, Nate? Yeah, yeah. mistake number three. Cool, and you have, I think, a lot to say on this one. (laughs) So I'm gonna turn this over to you right away. But mistake number three is improvising the hiring process. So we talked about just Mm -hmm. kind of improvising the job description. We talked about, you know, desperation. A lot of this is lack of preparation, um, but improvising the hiring process. So again, making it up as you go along. I think the antidote right before I turn it over to you, Nate, is just to stop what you're doing and doc, you know, documenting your hiring system or at least make one up or again, go out and look at how another company might do it. Um, but Nate, I think without getting, turning this into an episode that's about hiring systems, Mm. Um, maybe you can give me a three minute bang, 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 bullet point, um, idea of maybe how you made mistakes around improvising, improvising the hiring process, how you solve that mistake, what you all might do, just some crunchy nugget that people can take away from, from this little more high level episode, more conceptual episode. Yeah. And we'll definitely, Daniel, we got to commit. We will do an episode where we do a deep dive into the Brooklyn Music Factory hiring process because I, I really think it's at this point to me it's just a it's like a work of art. We've been developing it for so many years. Is it bulletproof? No, nothing is, and but it's but it's really really close. So well, before you jump into it, I mean, I've got to say to say bulletproof hiring process. I've seen it. I know that when you all put out a call for mm. applicants. Sometimes you're getting anywhere between 40 to 100 applicants. Um, mm. 
and you're you're hiring really good people. So I, I I just want to personally attest when Nate says bulletproof hiring process, I really I I really stand by that. It's it's awesome. So I, I'm going to give you that accolade, Nate, there, and tell everyone to take what you're about ready to say very seriously. Um, totally. So. Let me, let me, can I reframe one comment you made just to make it a little bit simpler for those that are like hiring system? What are you talking about? All you really need to do is get your journal out and give yourself an hour of uninterrupted time and say, what have I done to hire the teachers so far? Like, what were the steps? Hmm, I first posted on Facebook. Then I went and I called like four friends from where I went to college. And then, you know, like just literally write down what steps have you taken to hire the best teachers you've had so far. That's what we mean by a system. And then from there, we can refine. We can start implementing, um, you know, new steps and next steps. And, and just know that you do have a system right now, whether you know it or not. You probably just need to get it down on paper. Okay, so first we said, Daniel, start with a clear job description. Second... You need to network, network, network to share that you are hiring. Where do you start? You start with your great teachers in-house. Then you go to social channels. You hit your email list. You network out there that, yes, you have a new opportunity. For the right fit, there's an amazing opportunity. And then, of course, you go to like Indeed and all the other places that you, you know, Craigslist or wherever else you might um, post your job description. And that job description, by the way, Daniel, that's gonna be a nicely designed landing page that's gonna have that well-conceived role, responsibilities, maybe a little bit about your school, the why behind your school. You're just gonna give them something that they can click through to, right? You don't wanna just get a pile of emails from people. You want them to click and land on a landing page just as if they were a customer coming to your school and have that person assess, is this the right fit for me? Um, next step we do is we try to automate, 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 automate as much as possible gathering all your documentation. So everything from a resume, we ask them to fill out three essay questions around our purpose and values. We ask them to upload a demo video to the G Drive. We ask them to give us three references, three to five references with contact information. All of that stuff with just a little bit of tweaking, you can automate so that it's just going into some Google Drive folders for you. Um, but you want to, at the very least, automate an email response asking for them to send those things to you. Um, and then basically, the next step for us is we weed out just based on documentation. Like, first of all, did people send all the documents we asked for? If not, they're probably not a good fit for us, right? We're, we're, how, many, how many people get cut out, percentage of people get cut out because they didn't even send everything you asked for when you're doing a hiring Dude, I don't, I don't have a concrete number for you, but I can tell you if there were 100 people that were interested, it's l way less than 50, 40, even 30% that actually get everything to us that we ask for. Yeah. Right? So right there, you're cutting out 50 to 70% of people that you don't even you want don't even, to. Yeah. No, I don't even. You can't want... even follow directions. Um, right. And I mean, I'm so tempted right now to ask you a question, you know, because I know... <laughs> Every person I've coached with a mid-sized to larger music school over the last, with a few exceptions, but over the last five years, they're hearing that number, a hundred applicants. How did you do that? Like we should, we should just do a whole episode on how to find people and how to get a lot of applicants and you know qualified applicants even. But we can't go there. We got to stick to the. We got to stick to the plan. Okay, so now you're weeding. You're in the weeding out process, right? The second, the next thing we do, and this was something we hadn't done for years, and then my partner um, said, "This is we got to do this." And, and she's a total ninja with hiring process. She's so good at this. Um, but she's like, "You start anyone who's made it. You've read their essay questions. Honestly, we go straight to the essay questions first. And so mm -hmm. one of our most basic questions is, "What does community mean to you?" You know, for us at Brooklyn Music Factory, building community is a key component of our mission. Right. So we ask them, what does community mean to you? And we're looking for stories that are really heartfelt and authentic, you know. And so if 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 it's there, then we set up a 15 minute Zoom chat with them. And it's just like a hello. How you doing? We're so psyched you're interested. And that's just actually an opportunity to have. It's like a little bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of a 
it's not a full interview. You're just saying like, hmm, you're just doing a quick values check. You're just like, what's this, what's this person like? What's the vibe? And you can get a whole lot on vibe just from a 15 minute or there. And mostly you're just looking for them to confirm what you already intuit, which is that they could be a really good fit, right? Once in a while you get a red flag though. You're like, oh, wait a minute, actually they can compose a great essay, but they're not a very good communicator. And since our school, one of our core values is communicate consistently to gain trust, we need people that are really comfortable with communicating. And just and so that's the next step in it. So I know we're going to go into deeper d dives on this. So the final thing I'll say is if they get to the point of, man, this is an A plus candidate, we're way into her, then we will not skip the step of calling references. And I promise you we have skipped that step in years past. And it comes back to bite you every time because as my partner pointed out, she's like, when you have a red flag, that's who you ask. Everybody, there's a little lingering thing. You're like, you know, this person seems so amazing, but it seems like she's moved between three different music schools in the last three years. And you can ask the references. Tell, tell us about that. Any, any thoughts on why? In addition, um, we'll go back to them before hiring them with a final question. Hey, we notice you've moved between three music schools in the last few years. It's a kind of a red flag to us because mm -hmm. at Brooklyn Music Factory, we were hiring someone who wants to be here three to five years. Well, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, and there it is. That's boom, boom, boom. That's our system. So let me ask a question. There are parts of that. Obviously, everyone's going to have an interview. Yes. We'll get into uh, detail later on that. Y yeah. What do you feel are the unique points of this? What makes what, what in there do you think that a music school owner is going to hear and say, oh, I never would have thought of that? Or maybe a different way to ask this would be, what do you feel is unique about this to, to BMF? Mm, I think a couple things. <clears throat> Number one, trusting and patience in a process that's going to take four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, right? That's number one. Num and so mapping out the process and not, because believe you me, who wants to try to cut corners? Me, I'm the owner. I'm like, hey, I'm the one in there subbing students. Da, 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 da. Maybe I can cut some corners and we can hire a little bit quicker, right? No, no, no. Do not save time and money in the hiring process. Take your time. That's number one. I think we do, a, we do a pretty good job of it. The number two thing is that I really think, and this is going to still feel kind of abstract to people that haven't done this, but we lead so hard with values and purpose and mission that it's a, it's a great way to weed people out. It's just you, you, because there's, you're, you're never, you know, we're in New York City. There's no shortage of A-plus musicians. Right? There's actually no shortage of A-plus educators. What there's a shortage of is uh, not necessarily a shortage of, but where you have to be very mindful is, are they the right fit for your unique community? Right? Are they the right fit for your unique community? Because as my friend put it, who runs this great Pilates studio and has for 25 years, she's like, Nate, if it feels weird, it is weird. <laughs> just don't, just save yourself the headache when hiring, if it doesn't feel right, just don't go there. Just move on. It's not, as we've talked about in past episodes, it's not a reflection of that human. It's not a judgment of that person, the applicant. It's just a reflection on whether or not they're the right fit for your small business. That's it, right? They're, yeah. they're a beautiful human and there is a right fit for them. It just might not be yours. Let me ask you a question. Fire. When you solve these problems, when you stopped hiring out of des desperation, when you had a succession plan in place where you, when you had subs in place, um, when you started making better job descriptions, clear job descriptions, when you started bit by bit, you know, you started with just journaling out like, well, what have I done in the past that works? And then it turned it into a, like a fully automated marketing machine. What was the result yes. that you saw in your music school? What was the result of 
being a little more anticipatory and a little less improvisational. Yeah. What did you see happen with your students? What did you see happen with parents? What did you see happen with your staff? What was your personal experience like? Mm-hmm. And there's four, there's four dimensions right there that we could talk about. There's probably more, but maybe let's, let's focus on the students. What did you see change in terms of the students, whether results or engagement or, or things of that nature, yes. when you stop being so improvisational around the hiring process? I would say number one is you are setting yourself, you're setting your students up for a quality experience right out of the gate with a new teacher. And so what we found is, and we do this at Brooklyn Music Factory, and we do it with pride, that our students will have four to seven different teachers over their seven years, right? So we are very confident that they can go between teachers and the quality experiences. So that's number one. And then I'm going to bring it actually back to me, just the personal experience. Please do. Founder, which is that when you do a slow hiring process and a patient hiring process, you get to know these people before they even start working with you. You really get to know them and you actually become invested in their well-being and their success before they even get hired, right? Because you've gone through this process with a couple of other other colleagues. And so then they land at Brooklyn Music Factory and you're like, man, I'm so excited to learn more about this, this, and this. Man, you had such an amazing essay. I literally cried when I read your essay about such and such. Tell me more about that. And honestly, what it does is it creates a workplace for me that is just so much more enriching. Because as I always say to everyone that I get am fortunate enough to work with, like my goal was always to surround myself with inspiring humans. Right? I just want to be energized around the thing that I love, which is, you know, nurturing students. Mm. That's it. I mean, I, I love playing music games. I love nerding out with mini me's, you know? And so it's like when, when you go through a hiring process where you're developing a community of teachers and staff that are all in it for the same reason that you are, you know, then what you can do, you show up to the job site and you're really energized. And you're just so inspired to be with these people. And that's the goal. I mean, honestly, I don't care what your, what your company is. I mean, the goal is ultimately to be surrounding yourself with people that are as inspiring and energizing or energized into the purpose as you are. Mm. So I love it. Those are on it. Yeah. And I'll add on or maybe end with this. You know, we talked about the experience for the owner. We talked about the experience for the students. One of the dimensions I spoke about was the experience for the teacher or the, the staff person himself. And I'll add in here that something that I've seen consistently, I'm going to borrow against this concept that you kind of get back from the universe what you put out there. Yeah. Uh, that it's a mirror back of what's going on. And your business is a mirror. And as I became more systematic, more intentional, more careful, I saw the quality of the applicants go up Mm. in that I wasn't even interfacing with people that weren't a good fit Mm. and that the kind of person that wanted to work with our company might, uh, might not have ever reached out given what I was doing before. Mm, Yeah. In other words, you know, a a big complaint, and again, I've referenced this a few times in in this conversation, a big complaint from music studio or music school owners is, I just don't get a lot of applicants. It could be that they're not even putting in the application. Mm, Yes. And and what I would say is that we had a summer camp that was a feeder program for for a music school. So we would attract new, uh, students in the summer so that we would go into the fall not even having to worry about marketing for that coming year because we had done it all january through may gotten 100 200 new kids and would fill up college grad um the schedules of college graduates just out of college with 20 30 40 students right um and something we consistently heard from the teaching staff to bring it back around 
and something I've consistently heard in support staff, not only for you know the summer camp and music schools I've been involved with, but even Grow Your Music Studio itself, is just, I really love to work here. It's very clear what's supposed to happen. Yes. Um, over and over again, I've, 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 I've heard that um, from different folks I've hired. And I would say that I didn't always hear that. As I got more intentional, as I started building out some of these things that we've described, that has been reflected back to me from other people that are quite appreciative for the calm, stable environment that has been created, not only by me, but by the other team members in these companies. And I would certainly say that that's true of your school as well, Nate, that um, you've created an environment that is a pleasant one to be hired into where, you know, a new teacher right off the street is going to be welcomed in that community that you've built there at BMF. And I think, I think that's um, worth noting. 